you've got spare time, create something, let that passive income in and invest that. And then you're always going to have some money behind you. Hello everybody and welcome to Seven Figures, a podcast where we talk about entrepreneurship, financial literacy, generating wealth and how to build a seven figure business from people who've actually done it. Today we have an esteemed guest today. We have my friend Mark Tilbury who dropped who dropped out of school at a very young age and managed to turn his passion for radio controlled models into a multi-million business and only recently how I discovered him he's become a TikTok sensation giving young people advice about entrepreneurship, business and finance. He's come all the way from Kent down today to give us some gems. My bro, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here today. No, that's no, the pleasure's all mine, you know <laughs> what I mean? And just to give the audience a bit of background and plug you a little bit. So Mark is a successful businessman, businessman who actually went on to TikTok, we're gonna find out why, and he kind of caught my attention just because of the insight he was given. The first video um, I saw of him, he was talking about um, about designer clothes and he was saying designer clothes and companies, they don't market to rich people, they market to people who want to be rich. And I was like, this guy knows what he's talking about. So I hit him up and we made it happen. So Mark, tell me before we get to now, where does it all begin? And when I say where does it all begin, I really want to know about your family background, like, you know, um, your introduction to entrepreneurship via your parents and the early age. What was that like? Well, really, my early age was um, good parents that go to work, worked hard. They're not entrepreneurs, absolutely not. Um, and I suppose, really, it was just a, a want to sell things. I just wanted to create more pocket money for myself. Yeah. So, you know, right from early age, it was washing cars and earning money, um, going fishing and selling the fish around the trade, <laughs> all around my house in the yeah. state that we were on. So, you know, there was always the entrepreneurial spirit, even though the schools were trying to beat it out of me. <laughs> I was coming back with a vengeance. <laughs> So, so tell me about this because the, the fish selling story is interesting because it, <laughs> it was the first time you kind of innovated in business because you said you went out and tried to sell 10 fish for five dollars and then, and then and then what happened <laughs> well actually we were selling 10 fish well we first of all we caught so many fish when we used Who to go caught the fish me and my mate oh. we literally went to dover <laughs> on the paper train in the morning because we weren't allowed to go night fishing and we'd cast off and you could catch four to six of these mackerel every time you cast it it was brilliant i don't know if you can still do it now or <laughs> yeah. not um, but we brought her home probably 200 fish, something like that. We put them in an ice bucket so they all kept fresh. And then people were barbecuing on Saturday evening. So we'd go around the estate selling 10 fish for a pound. And that business was useless. So we had to restructure the business. That's a good bargain though, 10 fish for a pound. Yeah, you think so. But we restructured it, five for a pound. And it was brilliant. It really went well. People wanted five to barbecue. They didn't want to stick them in the freezer. They were going to use them there and then. And it worked really, really well. We sold double the amount of fish and for double the amount of money. It was fantastic. (laughs) So wait, so this is too early entrepreneurship. I mean, it it seems like it was born within you. Like, this is crazy. So first of all, who taught you how to fish? And... How did you see the fishing as an opportunity? Like it was just the, what... well, the opportunity. I, I I enjoyed fishing. I taught myself to fish. We just used to go and do that, me and my mate, and that was just something we did. Uh, selling the fish was more a case of we enjoyed catching so many, and what were we going to do with them? Throw oh. them back? You know, you couldn't keep two hundred fish, so <laughs> you got to sell them. You created a product. You've got to then feed a market with it or find a market, and that's what we did. It was uh, happy days. So, so how how old are you at this time? I was probably about 10 or 11 years old. 11? Yeah, I wasn't allowed night fishing, you see, so it was definitely around that area. Uh, so we used to catch a paper train from Sittingbourne, which uh, doesn't run anymore, but back in the day you'd catch that about 4 o'clock. No ticket office open, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so that was really <laughs> yeah. handy. So uh, yeah, we kept, had, kept our business costs under control, <laughs> and of course on the way back, sorry mate, I've lost my ticket, you know, I had it small. Yeah, and, I, know, know, I don't so know where I know. It's, it's well good, isn't it? So yeah, it worked really well, low business costs and uh yeah good turn good. so what did you um, buy with the money when you make um well mostly for me it was modeling stuff because i was into the radio control models even at a young age oh, and okay. everything was about funding my hobby and obviously trying to build up a little bit of money and um, that's what we did so it was oh, a lot of fun cool man so you had this entrepreneurial spirit and you go into school you said it's not cultivated but you gravitated towards what carpentry as a subject, right? You said yeah, I, you said you had a good carpentry, a uh, woodwork teacher. Yeah, sorry. I did. Uh, Mr. West, he was. He yeah. was a very good teacher, and he, I think, he could see a little bit in me as opposed to the other teachers that were like, he's just a class clown, you know. He, were he, you? Was that you? Well, a little bit, yeah. But you know, you could have done better. Is basically what all of my uh, reports would say, and perhaps I could. But the problem is. 
things like history at the time didn't interest me. I'm quite interested in it now, <laughs> but at the time it was of no interest because I couldn't see how I could use that to to further my career, as it were. And uh, I just ended up wanting to get out of school and uh, follow my own uh, lead, as it were. So um, I find it interesting. I think specifically, like, in, I came from an African household. Education is paramount, and I'm sure it is, like, around the environment you grew up as well. Yeah. But you wasn't pressured by your parents to go to school, because I noticed that um, with your son Curtis as well, who's here on the cameras yeah. doing all that stuff, um, you haven't put that same pressure on him as well. How, how was that conversation with your parents when you said to them, I don't want to um, continue with education at this point. Um, I think they were quite acceptant of it. You know, the at the time, sixteen was a normal sort of age to okay, leave that's school, true, yeah. and because it was, um, I was going into a trade. I think they were quite happy with that. I actually had about, I think it's about three or four jobs lined up because I thought I've got to find something. Because <laughs> the careers guy said you're only going to go to YTS, a youth training scheme, which was twenty pounds a week. And I thought I'm, I'm not doing it. youth <laughs> training scheme. So I, I lined up about three or four apprenticeships took the one I wanted, you know, I was really happy to be working at the place I went to. And um, the other three I gave away to my friends. One of them now runs the business that I gave him the job for as an Whoa, apprentice. How about that? That's crazy, yeah. <laughs> that's many so years what, down what, the line. what business was that one you gave him? Uh, Herbert's Engineering was the name of the company. Oh, wow. And uh, so he runs that now, the fridge, uh, Refrigeration Engineers. Oh, that's dope, man. It's yeah. very rare. That's Amazing, a, yeah, that's an air. Yeah. <laughs> so, so your friend go. Um, so you give all your friends the other three jobs, and you yeah. stick with the one job. What's the one job that you stuck with? In your I was. Uh, I stuck with cabinet making and carpentry. And the, the the place I went to work for, I have to say, they used to make a lot of work for Cannon Street, which is not too far. Yeah, from it's around the corner. Yeah. And uh, a lot of bank work. You know, uh, really nice desks and staircases. You know, I looked at what like, this is. What I want to be doing. I, I like the look of this. I could progress through this company. This will be fantastic. So from day one, I wasn't necessarily looking at being on the benches all the time. I was looking to progress up through the company. Oh, okay. So that's why I had that little bit of a rub with the uh, with the foreman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So you're going to talk about that then. If you're saying, so you're working, you started very entrepreneurial, you start working... Um, and then there's, there's a point where you're like, this isn't for me anymore, although yeah. you was passionate. Do you want to talk about that then? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's one of those things. If you can't get the job that you like or you're not enjoying where you are, then you've got to do something about that, haven't you? I mean, you've got to... Some people say you should do what you enjoy. Mm -hmm. I always say you should, you, know, you should enjoy what you do, That's which a is a little point. bit yeah. different. So, you know, sometimes you can take on a passion and it can all go wrong and you hate that passion for the rest of your life. But if you enjoy what you do when you're doing it then that's great and uh, that's what I wanted to do I wanted to get out I was making he was forcing me to make these bins these wooden bins and they had a massive contract with it was Safeways at the time I think and they Morrison's did, now right uh, well it's, it was Asda and Walmart it okay. was that, that sort of thing I think uh, or Safeway I can't remember exactly. <laughs> but anyway there was thousands of these bins and I, I confronted him on it I said you know I, d I don't want to be doing this I want to be making these beautiful staircases I want to be making these beautiful desks and things that that's what I came here for and he said well we got a massive contract you'll be making bins today and you'll be making bins for the foreseeable future and that was the point where I said right well, I'm gonna have to turn this around so uh, you know no looking back <laughs> so, what, so how does turning around look like for you at that point well, at that point, I was working part-time in a model shop. So on my Saturdays, I was uh, selling model goods anyway, which is really where my passion and what I really enjoy doing comes from. And on Sundays, I was teaching people to fly radio control helicopters, which was, there was a huge demand out at the time. Um, in fact, the demand was so huge, I couldn't fit enough people in. And then I used to take the helicopters away and tune them up in the week and bring them back on the following Sunday so I could earn a bit more in the week. Um, and that's where I wanted to be. I wanted to start a, a model business, yeah. um, which uh, is another story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, let's go into it. Let's go. But I actually, wanna, I want to stop for a second. So you were working. How many hours were you working to be able to commit to working? Were, were you working seven days a week, essentially? Uh, I'd say, yeah, I was working seven days a week. But I think the Sundays was a sort of a me time working experience because I would be at the model flying field anyway because that's what I like to do on a Sunday. Yeah. And the fact that it became more and more work it wasn't really hard work because a lot of people had, be had better models than I had. It gave me the chance to experience those models yeah, as well. Yeah. So it was quite nice, really. Did, did you set up this training thing as a business or was it already established and you stepped into it? Or did you just... No, it was, a, it was a, you know, just grew as a business, really. So it was quite nice. Yeah. Oh, so you, so you, it grew thing, as yeah. your own little business. You were like, yeah. I'll, pay, I'll pay me this much and I'll teach you how to fly these. Yeah, people. exactly that. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And how did you promote that? 
Well, I didn't really need to promote it too much. I was working in the shops on uh, Saturday afternoons in a model shop, so I'd say to every customer, you do know <laughs> that I'm a member of this club, and if you come down, I can give you an hour, and I charge X amount for an hour. And uh, when they were there, of course, I'd say, not only can I do this, you know, your model it could be a bit better if I took it away, and I could make any model fly better. That's, that's without a doubt. So I'll take it away, bring it back next week, and it'll be, oh, great, I can fly it now. Oh, so it's a yeah. good, good business. So you were taking business away, not me, you were making you up selling basically yeah and to be honest it was making more business for the shop that I was working in because as soon as they could fly they would want the next model up and then the next model up so it was actually creating a lot of business for that that company yeah so so that so you've got three jobs right now so you're working the full time you're working yeah. at a model shop and you, no that's a lot of jobs yeah. yeah and how old were you at that time well I'm going to add to that I was flipping cars on the side oh, as yeah. well <laughs> <laughs> Bro, so you're just like a yeah. natural hustler. Yeah, yeah, just flipping cars on the side. Who brought you into flipping cars? Well, a friend of mine did cars anyway, and it was just a case of, you know, I, I had a bit of debt because I bought a car and it went wrong and I borrowed, so you learn this oh, lesson. Sh- yeah. Then the car goes bang and you've got to repair it, so you go a bit deeper into debt. And it just it was just one of those moments where you go, you know, I'm four grand in debt. I don't earn four grand in a year officially with my work, so how am I going to get out of debt? Well, I said, right, this year, I'm going to be out of debt at the end of the year. I'm going to work my what's it off. And flipping cars was one of the things that helped with that. And at the end of that year, I had over four grand positive in the bank account. So not only did we pay off the debt that looked unpayable yeah. at the time, you know, we had a nice big chunk, which is what I always refer to as an emergency fund in most of my videos. Because yeah. once you've got a chunk of cash behind you, life becomes a lot easier. Yeah, yeah, Much yeah, because easier. yeah, yeah, because you can make decisions without that pressure exactly of having to that. And when something goes wrong in your life, you can sort it out. You've got the money, you know, washing machine goes wrong. Oh, it's still horrible to have to go and buy one. Yeah. But you can, can't you? It's yeah, not yeah. you're not going, oh, I've got to borrow for that because you've got that fund there and you put it all back in there as soon as possible and it's interest free. Yeah. Fantastic. So, so, so who, who taught you the idea of having this emergency fund? Well, you know, I, I often look back and I don't really know anyone that specifically taught me this but I did have a very very good what I would call a mentor now but at the time he was a a friend within the model club you know he always had a bit of money on his hip always had the nice car wife (laughs) had the nice car you know he'd been around done a few things and he'd always be dropping me these snippets of information now I don't even think he knew he was doing that yeah it was just I was very receptive to it and I mean, he's, he's died now. I get a bit emotional when I have oh, to say sorry, that. Sorry, rest um, in peace. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and I visit his um, his tree quite often. Mm. Um, but you know, he helped so much with with what I went on to do, and and purely the fact that he was self employed. You know, he he put that on to me. I think that you know, you you, you can do it. He knew I could do it. Yeah. So maybe it takes an entrepreneur to see that sometimes. Yeah. You know, because um, you've got to recognise that in yourself. And once you do, you, there's no stopping you, is mm, there? Mm. And I think that's where that came from. So, he, yeah, I totally agree. I think once you have a mentor, it kind of reinforces all the feelings that you're kind of having, that's you know it, what I mean? Yeah. Someone like viable proof that this is possible. Yeah, and particularly when you're at school, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've uh, witnessed this, that, you know, you just get beaten down, you know, like, and even, even parents to a certain degree, yeah. you know, they'll say, you know, you need a good job, you need a good salary, you know, do, do, do it like this, and before you know it, you've got fallen comfortable into a, into, mm. um, a career, then you get the house, then you get the wife, then you get the kid, and, then, and before you know it, you are sort of trapped, mm. and uh, that's not what I wanted. And uh, I think schools have got to recognise that when someone might be the class clown, for example, <laughs> yeah, actually there's a reason for that and they should maybe tap them on the head and say, yeah, you've got that spirit, you know, you could go off and do your own thing and you could do quite well. Um, and a lot of people have got that, haven't they? But yes, I think it gets definitely. beaten out of them a bit by the parents, a lot by the school system. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And then those that have got it that go to university, when they come out the other side, you know, they are going into a cushy job sometimes yeah. and, and that's never going to happen for them, the entrepreneurial yeah, thing. They're going to be crazy. selling their five days a week for their two days off at the well, weekend and you think, well, that's never going to go anywhere. Yeah, you you kind of limited how much you, of your potential you can access. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So at this time, 
like you're saying, the teachers wouldn't encourage you. You had this mentor, and your parents. Like, what was your relationship like with your parents? Oh, no, you it's like, a very good relationship with yeah. my parents. There's no wrong there at all. I, it was just that uh, my dad was very much a nine to five. What sort did he work as, if you don't mind me asking? Um, he was. Uh, he worked for an electrical company that make electrical connectors. Oh, so very just hands on. Yeah, he did end up working for me. Funny enough. Oh, really? Oh, but, wow. Um, I, I, I said this to someone earlier that. Um, you know, you don't see your dad age. Your dad is your dad, isn't it? You yeah. know, you always look at him. Yeah, he's always he's, a hero. Oh, there, it's dad, you know. <laughs> it doesn't change. You know, he's solid as a rock. But I saw my dad age over about a two-year period, maybe even a year period, which is a short period to see someone aging. Yeah. And I had to sit down like we are here and have a discussion and say, Dad, you know, what's going on? You know, you, you look worn out. And he said, well... They've made two or three guys redundant at work. I'm happy to do all their jobs because I can. The the guy who runs the business officially isn't. He's off playing golf. Yeah, because he's a street, yeah. And um, he, he said, you know, it, it's getting me down. And I said, right, well, leave. He said, well, I can't leave. I've got commitments. Yeah. I said, well, we'll open another shop. So we opened a shop in Ashford. He ran it until the day he retired. Wow, that's gold. Okay, we're going to get to how you yeah. got to this point. Cool. <laughs> so, okay, so now we've got to this point where you're working all these jobs. You've come out of there and, and the entrepreneurial spirit is kind of bubbling in you because this guy yeah. has already said to you that, listen, you're going to be making these wooden bins forever. Yeah. Yeah. So, so tell me how we go from there to what's your first venture and model works. Well, the, the, the first venture is a, a company called Model World. Which Model World, sorry, yeah, I my bad, right. so yeah. It nearly was Model World. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I actually confided in a friend of mine. He, again, even though he's done what I'm going to tell you he did, I'm still a friend with him. I actually saw him last week. He came over for a cup of coffee and we chat about things. Um, but I gave him all my ideas. And this was the guy I was working for part-time in the model shop. And I was giving him all these ideas, telling him why this location's great. This is what I'm going to do. There's definitely a market. And I'm learning from you at the moment. I'm going to transfer that and run my own model shop. And uh, he did it. <laughs> he did it before I had the chance. But, but it's a good lesson to learn because I wasn't ready to start because I didn't have the backing. I didn't have the credit score to get the loans that I needed. So it was one of those things. I didn't have everything in place to be able to do it. But wait, let's talk about this then. So... Um, I think this, this is a good point because there's this concept of sharing your ideas with people, yeah. people do it online, you yeah. know, people express what it, how do you feel about that now after your experience? How um, do you feel about sharing your... I think you're a little bit more caged about ideas until you've got it signed, sealed and delivered. You know, you don't really say too much about it. And with experience, it's easier to do that, isn't it? You know, when you're young and you're, yeah, everything's great and everyone's great and he's giving me a job, he's great. And you don't expect that. And the fact that someone opens exactly the business in exactly the spot that you were going to open and calls it the same name. I mean, the name Model World came from a BBC television series when I was a kid. I still have the, they used to do albums for all these programs. Oh. I still have the album Model World BBC program. So I know that that That's was my name it, for it. Yeah. It's always going to be the name. And um, yeah, he, he took the idea. How old were you in, when, at, at this point? Um, I was probably 19, just turned 19. As and a 19 I, year old, what is your mental state? Because for me, that is beef. Like me, like, I yeah, don't know, like, I'm burning down your shop or something. Yeah, to me, it, it nearly knocked me down. Um, yeah, it did knock me, knock the wind out of me. But I didn't want to give up what I was doing because, yeah, everything I was doing was working. It was still related to his shop. So I still worked for him part time. And that was a good move. I could have just gone, you, know, you know what, that's it. You know, but I didn't. I, I knuckled down. I worked really hard with him and doing all the other things I did. And I think it was about eight months later, he said, you know what, I've had enough of that shop down at May saying It's not doing very well. Um, I'm going to sell it, get rid of it, close it down. I went, well what do you want for it? And he told me a price. I said, I'll buy it. There and then, the minute he said. And I'm glad I did because he probably would have changed his mind had I left it another day. But the fact I said, no, I'll buy it. And then I just had to put everything in motion to be able to buy that business. And the reason it didn't work is because he didn't have the passion yeah, he wasn't, for modern yeah, world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he had the passion for the business he was doing, pretty much, okay. but not for that. And it was a different thing. You know, yeah. it's a totally different animal. And he put a manager in there and it wasn't going to work from day one, really. I think I think that's two important lessons in that. The fact that, I mean, sometimes we let our emotions get, get ahead of our logic. But you logically yeah. looked at it and was like, OK, this is a setback. But logically, I can still leverage the position I'm in. Yes. And then the second lesson is that opportunity. The opportunity came and you were just like, so how much did he say he was going to sell it for? 
Um, I can't give you that information. Okay, that's fine. That's totally um, fine. The, the only thing, I mean, I talk open finance. Yeah, that's fine, yeah. But what I don't talk about is actual personal. Yeah. So, but um, it, was a, it was a figure that was more than I could uh, scrape together, <laughs> should we put it that way. Yeah. And I had to go to the bank and, and, and borrow. And the first bank turned me down, absolutely blank turned me down. Well, like why, why did, what did you go into the bank with? I want to know. Like, what well, I had to make up a business plan. <laughs> I mean, how'd you do that? Yeah, you've, got, you've got to make a business plan. Think, well, you know, I know what I want to do. It's all up here. No, you've got to put it down on paper. So we put it all on paper and did project, uh, projections and everything. Um, and to be honest, I don't think he looked at them. He looked at me and went, yeah, you're a youngster. You ain't got a yeah, chance. Yeah. You know, there's no way we're lending you any money. But as fate would have it, rather than moping out, you know, I went out thinking, oh, I am a bit deflated, but, you know, worse things have happened. Walked along the street and there was Barclays Bank, literally next door. I turned yeah. the corner, literally next door. And I said, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna go in there and pretend I've got a meeting with someone and just see what I can do. And I blagged the meeting there and then. I, and he said, well, have you got a business plan? Well, as, as it happens, put all the business plan down. He read it. A guy called Mr. May, he's not there anymore. And he saw, again, something in yeah. me. And he said, you know what, We're, I'm all about helping youngsters that come in and they're prepared to put their life on the line to start Absolutely. a business that they that they know. Yeah. And um, he said, not only that, we're going to sort the money out for you and I'm going to be your first customer. Wow. How about that? I, I need to figure this out because normally when I'm tracing people's stories, I, I, I'm able to find a link with how they're able to like, because your mentality was just so like, you can't, it's, it's defiant, you get what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. Was there a kind of like inspiration, entrepreneurial inspiration, other than your friend that was like, who walks into a bank, then walks into the next one and says, okay, I'm going to just, when, well, when, I, can I, you think back know, now, do you, I, know, do you know why you did that? I, I'm not sure. It's a, I, I think everyone has, well, maybe they don't have the same feelings. Maybe some feel rejection worse. I'm not sure. But I think we all feel the rejection um, or the put down. But some of us can go, nah. Put that at one side. Let's go on again. <laughs> you know, he, he didn't see something I know that's there. Let's go and show it to someone else. And I, I think that's sometimes the way. It's just a different direction to look at yeah. things. Have you always, you looking back through your life and now, have you always been like that? Been able to put, because I think it's important, be able to put your emotion aside and just move with your logic and self-belief. Yeah. Like, if there was any anything that kind of was the catalyst for that, it'd be great to know. Or... Well, I think it's all about, you know, you're going to have some failings along the way. If you, if you don't fail, you haven't tried. Mm. I mean, that's absolute law without a doubt. But the thing with failing is, is, is learn the lesson from it and then move Keep on. Keep it moving, Put yeah. it in the past. That's, yeah. that's gone. What can you do about that? Nothing. You can learn from it, but you can't do anything else about it. So that's what I've always tried to practice. Learn from the mistakes, then dump it Literally. and then move on keep it moving yeah so now you've you've moved past your mistakes of telling someone else your business they've taken it model world officially opens yeah. so tell me what's the first day like because this must have been a, a dream come <laughs> true right well it is and it isn't you know, <laughs> um, you arrive on the first day and the, the problem with um opening a shop is obviously you've got you've got costs straight away overheads, it's not like yeah. building a little business and gradually building it up to to those overheads you've got them from day one I arrived in my car on the first day. I put my sleeping bag on the back seat, literally, because if I couldn't take some money that day, I was sleeping in that car because yeah. I, I didn't have enough money to put any more petrol to get, in. To get back, yeah. I put everything into this, you know, absolutely everything was, was on the line. Um, but as it turned out, we had a fabulous day and I was there on that day with the guy that sold it to me because he was stock taking and everything. Yeah. And he went, blimey, you've had a good day. And I went, yeah, yeah, that's obviously a flash in the pan, isn't it? Yeah. He went, yeah, yeah, definitely. And to this day, in a shop, we have never taken less than that day. Not one day. Seriously. Seriously. You know, and that's amazing, really. You know, because you think, well, I always think with a shop, people have to make the decision to come to it. Have to yeah, travel, how, how do you, you know. It, like... And how, you know, one day, someone might not decide yeah. to come to your shop. So there should be a day where you do nothing. But we've never, ever done that. Every single day we have opened, we've always taken more than that first day. And that was a good day. Oh, How about that? That's amazing. <laughs> How did you promote it then to get people to come? Well, there was all sorts of promotion. I mean, obviously the fact that I've been doing lots of helicopter lessons, working Every, in another shop, you, you know, of course yeah. I happened to mention that uh, 
I'm going to be at a different place very, very soon. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that's why you keep all that stuff going, isn't the it? The network, it's yes. All the networks, all the connections. And then a lot of people wanted to come to us because, you know, I was very much into the you know, radio control helicopters and they knew that. So they wanted me to do their machine, me to sell them expert, the machine. Yes. Well, that was the thing, yeah. And uh, then I went into competing with model helicopters, sort of in the UK to start with and then around the world. And of course, you get a name for that. And oh, so you was a bit of a celebrity? then yeah in, I, in that world you know, like, i always know. wish that tiktok and you know facebook and all those sort of things were available then because the the following in from japan for example was absolutely huge and of course that sort of disappears a little bit the business connections stay but lots of little bits disappear. yeah people grow up and connect yeah, with, yeah relationship. And back then it was it was great you know you, we could have had such a following and just kept it yeah. flowing along so you were <laughs> so you were you were technically running a business but you were also the biggest endorsement for your business because you pretty much you had the skills so yeah. when you're talking about flying around the world so you was competing yeah yeah with the british team i was on the british team for 10 years uh seven times national champion Shit, seriously yeah yeah all oh, right uh, okay. bronze medal at europeans and a bronze medal at world championships so it's serious a, yeah yeah we've done a bit oh right, so you've paid your dues man yeah, so this is, this is bit, no, yeah. okay so this is no so I, i'm understanding now first of all the success of model world is not an accidental success because you've built the foundation you yeah. spent years becoming an expert building yeah. the network but on top of it as well you're an athlete essentially you know what i mean you compete not exactly yeah. Right. yeah so you so you kind of apply that athlete mentality to yeah. everything you do like build work hard and and i'm, yeah. I'm sure i've never seen a competition but i'm sure it's quite high quite intense right? oh, yeah, a lot of pressure absolutely. To deal with. yeah yeah very yeah. very hard in oh. fact the the world championships that we came uh, i got bronze medal at that was um during the 9-11 disaster seriously yeah so uh, i flew my best flight i'd ever flown at a world champs during that day and then we all went on to lockdown on the site so how about that yeah. in america when that all happened it was a it's quite a crazy day that i was. got goosebumps bro that's yeah. an experience man yeah. oh <laughs> shit so okay so um so when you were competing you were still running the business and working all yeah. these jobs as well uh, no the jobs gradually got dropped lot, away yeah. because it wasn't possible for me to teach eventually because i needed to be flying and what i used to do for my practice i would fly first thing in the morning so as soon as it was light i was out flying i'd have six flights five days a week that would be my practice routine and in the evenings i'll be tinkering with the models to, to keep them all diligent, spot up. Yeah. yeah so you really really made a business out of your passion like what you, you yeah. saw what, what your passion was your life and yeah. you modeled the business out no so you yeah. was going to be successful i think it's important for people watching to know that like you can monetize anything essentially if you're yes. passionate enough about yeah. it yeah it's not just passion you you've got to separate the passion from the business otherwise yeah. the business will either suffer or the passion will suffer yeah we'll talk. i mean if you look at them being exactly the same then i'd be sick and tired of models by now <laughs> wouldn't i uh, which i don't want to be because it is a passion i mean i'm, I'm racing model airplanes this weekend oh so, okay so you know, you're still out here oh, I'm still at it <laughs> that's for sure so you know it's all good fun things isn't it you, you've got to have your enjoyment you've got to have your social side and uh, that's all part of it oh so 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 if we continue with the story so I, i'm understanding now i'm getting a shape and picture of why model world like you said it hasn't had a, a, a hasn't had the lower day than when you started yeah. so essentially your business is a success what's your next step from there then well the did next, you see it as a success well uh, i suppose so i mean you, you i suppose as a, an entrepreneur you just see that that's what it's going to do and it does it yeah yeah, yeah. um we'll rather talk. than going yeah i'm successful I'm su now <laughs> i don't think at any stage you put the flag up to do that if you're a true entrepreneur yeah, yeah. Um, but the next stage was obviously employment dad and we opened up ashford and then um i took a partner and opened up in seven oaks um but then of course bam come along the internet, the internet yeah. and really bricks and us brick shops weren't the way to be from that point on you I, I think nowadays you need one shop and a very good uh internet access and lots of Presence, different yeah, yeah di lots of different sources of income so uh yeah, that, that changed after after that time otherwise we would have probably franchised model world or or push forward to, to model make world. like toys or something and make yeah across the country yeah. yeah so um how many employees did you have at this time then because it seemed like you um, i think i think we've got 12 employees at the moment um 
more than that if you include um, I have a couple of agents in China that help me out um, and obviously the factories in China that we use um, obviously they're not employees of mine but they're factory time that we buy to produce our products so um, uh, it's hard to, to gauge a business just on the number of employees nowadays you used to be able to say oh you've got 10 oh well, that'd be three there two there one there um, really all of those are part of our team, team whoever yeah, they are, whoever's you know. yeah. So, um, so, so when the internet came, did Century UK come into the picture? So, sorry, Century, um, the Century, yeah, Century UK come into the picture before or after the internet? Um, probably before, because when I first <laughs> yeah, do you want to talk about? That? I don't want to that, skip that part. That's another story. Isn't yeah, it? no, I think that's an important <laughs> part. Like, I mean, basically, um, I was selling lots of one particular helicopter, and this guy in the states made. Um, uh, a hop up for it, a totally different chassis, which made a lot of sense. So you could put new sides on this helicopter, made it fly much better. And I thought, you know what, I need that. So I said to the wife uh, or girlfriend at the time, I said, uh, fancy going to LA? She said, oh yeah, when are we going to do that next year? I said, no, I thought we'd go Saturday. <laughs> so <laughs> we jumped on a plane and uh, sort of had a bit of a holiday going up Highway 1, seeing all the sites. And this was way back in the day. In fact, I forgot to take my driving license with me as well. <laughs> yeah. so I ended up at dodgy car dealers and a real dodgy dodge dynasty as it happened we drove up the coast knocked on his door when i got there i said oh i'm just sort of uh passing by i thought i'd uh, pop in he said well that's a long road yeah, trip yeah, yeah. It, from the UK. <laughs> and we hit it off and um at the end of that trip i had a deal to bring in these models and these accessories and that was called um century usa century, yeah, yeah. um so that's why the term century uk came about although we're totally separate companies um, that's why we're called Century You UK. was licensing the brand or? Uh, we were buying the product from oh, him. Oh, oh. And originally we were only selling Century products from the USA, but that was getting a bit restrictive. Yeah, I can imagine. Mm. So how, how does a negotiation like that work? Did you have to did you have to show him how much you're selling? Because I think people, a lot of people might want to engage in a similar relationship. How does that negotiation work? Did you have experience in doing it? Or? Um, no, that was my first experience of buying from abroad. Um, and yes, he wanted me to guarantee him certain figures, but to be honest, no one can guarantee certain figures. And I was just honest and straight with him. I said, look, you know, if we import X number of these on the first order, I'm pretty much guaranteed I'm gonna sell those. And then it'll be from the next order, we really know what the numbers are. And the first order came in, it was all sold before it arrived. Well, all bar one, I think it yeah. was. And then the second order rolled in, which was twice as many, and that sold well because it coincided with a trade fair we were at, and we got billed on the front cover of the of the trade fair. Oh. So of course people went, oh, that's new. And they all flocked to our stand to buy the new product, which was great. Um, so. That's how it's done. I mean, most times you don't have to buy as much or to, or commit to as much as you think you'll have to yeah. with most of these guys. Well, most people, um, when I started going to China, it was, you've got to buy a container. You know, it's got oh, to be a container yeah. full of this, a container full of that and so on. They realize that's now not the real world. Um, so you can really reduce those numbers. You can start filling containers from different people. So it's not anywhere near as hard as it was. And with the internet and email, it's a lot easier to get these connections and and talk to these people. Yeah, a lot easier than yeah, when I yeah. Before, yeah, you have to drive all the way here. Um, so I was going to ask this quickly. So tell me about radio controlled models a bit. Um, are there, so do you sell these at like high prices? Like, what's the average price of like a helicopter? Well, most model aeroplanes and helicopters, mm. people think they're dearer than what they are. Yeah, because so, I've never. Yeah. yeah, the most popular design that I sell is a model called a Max Thrust Riot. I designed it in geography at school when I was about you 15 years old. You designed them as well? Old. Yeah, I designed them. You didn't say this, bro. You, well, made you, know, this, you designed you, them as you well. You gradually <laughs> pull it all out. But I actually designed that when I was 15 in, in a geography lesson. I can actually remember the lesson where I penned this outline of this model, never knowing that I was going to then be get selling it. it. Exactly. Wow. So um, Thomas said, look, if you want to manufacture, you've got to get out to China. That's the place to manufacture. So I thought, you know, I'll jump on a plane and <laughs> go to China. China. And a friend of mine over here wrote a, a note for me, all in Chinese. He said, and then put on the top, this is for the taxi man at the airport. And then there was another one. He said, that's to get you to the tray fair you want to go to. All I, in the I, characters. I, yeah. I didn't know what said. <laughs> yeah. So I handed it to him. I don't know where I was going to end up. I ended up at the right hotel. And then in the morning, I handed it to him. I ended up at the trade fair. And as soon as you start meeting people and pressing the flesh, as it were, you know, that is the best way to get loyalty. 
What do you mean pressing the flesh? Well, just meeting them, shaking hands, yeah. getting to know them. That's where the loyalty is built up. Okay, if you're buying purely online, you can't be surprised to find out that two, three, ten, hundred other people are selling the same product as you. Oh. If you want to get yourself an exclusive deal and get some loyalty from these factories, then you've really got to get out there and meet the people and get a, a social connection with them. Oh, okay, and I think that's important even more so in this day and age because yeah. we... We're under the impression that oh, everything can be done via the internet, you yeah. know what I mean? Kind of like email, email. Yeah, so, a lot can, but you're not going to get that loyalty. That same kind of, yeah. yeah. So the first guy I met out there, he invited me to his factory. So the next time I went, went straight to his factory, um, which was in Shenzhen. And, um, you know, we've been mates ever since. You know, now he's no longer owns that business. And when I go to China on a business trip, I have to make time to go, to and, go and see, see him. him. Yeah. We'll have a nice dinner and chat about old times. You know, and I've got about three or four friends like that now that are no longer necessarily in the trade. But I go and get see them. So I've got a social network yes. in, in China, which is great. Because China Powerful. China's quite a draining place to do business. You really? Know? And when you've got a social network, you can you know fall back on those like you do at home you know you fall back and rely on your wife and your friends and everyone else um in china that's very hard unless you've got that yeah and now it's quite nice because when you go out go oh, oh three days i'm going to go and see so and so four days i'm going to go see david yeah. or whatever it's very good that's so it seems like you're quite adept at making like relationships with the people you work with like is, is, is and that's kind of like that's is that I guess you've always been networking in business from when you was helping people with their planes yeah. and then turning them into customers. Let's con so you get to the internet. The internet comes out, yeah, takes a blow to your business. You're looking at yeah. the world like the world has changed. Yeah, was there was there ever a moment when the light bulb hit where it was like, okay, I have to adjust now, or did it just happen naturally? Uh, Two thousand and ten was a I think was a big game changer. We'd had the recession, and then two thousand and ten we'd made the decision that. Yeah, really, Ashford was finished because my dad wanted to retire anyway. And we thought, well, that's a good good, good end there. Yeah. And uh, I didn't trust the people in the shopping centre. Not more than anyway. your dad, obviously. Yeah, 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 yeah. I thought, no, <laughs> let, 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 let that go. And the guy who um, I partnered with in Seven Oaks, he decided he'd like to buy me out. And I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll go with that. So he bought me out, ran it for six years. And unfortunately, it wasn't successful for him. I helped him relocate and do all sorts. But he wasn't successful and he ended up coming back and helping me and he was doing all my service repairs and stuff which was quite nice but that was the point where we realized that it won't work as a multi shop but if we pull it back to one then we looked at the cost of the one i went the costs here are too dear this is going to cripple us so we moved to another location which is hard to do because you know all your customers know where you are yeah, yeah. and to move to another town another think, town yeah what, what's going to happen yeah. here but actually it's the best thing we did and um then we started pushing forward on the web so and, and cost oh, so then customers started buying online yeah i'd say seven years ago was when our web sell started building from and that's when we moved the business because we knew it was going to be more bricks and clicks from that point on oh hmm. so the internet that was early days you were talking about how what how were you selling by the internet like, is it, was it just like um, Amazon or Amazon not at the time eBay right you're saying well eBay's always been good for us because that's where the model fraternity seem to do their shopping Amazon doesn't really work very well for us we've tried it actually we tried it on two occasions uh, we've also tried it and they've looked at our product and gone and found other Ripped products it, yeah. so you know we knew that was going to be an issue so at least with uh, eBay we retain all the customer information and the information is key the if you're going to if you're doing a good job for your customer you want their information the because you can do yeah. another good job for them you know so data is everything um, and obviously the web sales we have a, a website that sells directly as well and uh, between all of those that, that works really very well I, I love the way like you have such a control over every element of your business in terms of so do, do, do you have the intellectual pattern rights and stuff all these helicopters that you make well, the, the helicopter is not such a big thing now, funny enough, although it's my history, the, the aircraft side of things is definitely the, the big thing for us. We sell a lot of aircraft, okay. and yes, we own the, uh, the, the design rights to those aircraft and the tooling as well. One of my first errors was that we didn't pay for the tooling, and I lost one of my best designs through the fact that we didn't own the tool, and the company went 
pop and they sold off the tools and I didn't get a chance to be able to buy it. Uh, but from that day on, we made sure we bought the tool in as we went. So. Oh, so now I see how the business has such value because yeah. you don't just sell the products, you make them and you own the rights to them. That's it. Oh. And also we can license the product as well. People. So um, just recently we've sold 500 of the rights to a company in the States. Um, they haven't called it that, but it's it's our model. And yeah. we get a, a basically a royalty payment on it because I don't have to do anything. It's, it's like a passive income, yeah. if you like, um, because all of the production is done through one factory. Tree. Um, they have to use my tool. I'm notified if the tool's used and for how many shoots of foam go through it. So I know if they're telling me what they should or, or not. <laughs> <laughs> Does, doesn't it blow your mind to sit back and think about all these designs you were tinkering with and like drawing in school have now become like properties that like go out into the world and create business with people? Yeah, w without a doubt. I mean, the, the pleasure I get if I go and visit a flying club and there's some of my designs there and sometimes more than 50% of the model aircraft there are sort of come from my pen. Oh, of course I'm as pleased as punch. I mean, it's yeah. great, isn't it? And then you see in the in the model press, you know, some youngsters pass their flying proficiency and he's holding his model there. <laughs> Guess what? Yeah, it's one of mine. Yeah. I mean, how nice is that? I mean, th this is the joy of, of, you know, enjoying what you do, isn't it? Yeah. You know, and you keep getting buzzes like that. And it's a bit like what we're doing now with the, with the YouTube and the TikTok, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Great feedback, it's fantastic. Let's talk about the TikTok. This is what before we wrap up, let's go into the TikTok. Where does the TikTok come from? Where what was the inspiration? You know what I mean? What, what t tell me about the TikTok journey? Well, sort of the inspiration is my, my son's a videographer and he enjoys doing that, and uh, we need something so we can work together. Um, and generally on skiing trips, funnily enough, yeah. we sit around the table and we're in chalet, so lots of new people, and, and the conversation keeps sort of uh, going towards business and investments and this sort of thing. And everyone's listening and I, you, I don't notice, you know, you just talk and you know, Curtis, my son said to me, he said, look, you know, people are interested in, in what you've got to say, the experiences you've had. Yeah. Um, it's not normal, you know, these are, it's you know, not you've had all. a great life, you've amassed, you know, amassed all this information. You know, we could share with the many rather than with the few. So we looked at the different platforms and YouTube was what my son was, you know, good at yeah. and enjoyed doing. And I liked it. I've been in a few of his videos <laughs> as well. We've got more followers than him now, so that's yeah, so, great. Yeah. <laughs> so you won um, that one. Yeah, we thought we'd we'd give it a go, especially during lockdown. The TikTok was sort of my idea. I, I'd heard about it and looked and I thought, you know, that, that could work. You know, all this swiping and suddenly an old guy, you think, well, what's he doing? That you was know? by that that was my, yeah, that was. you know, and that's quite a good thing, isn't it? People do stop at it and they go, oh, there's some interest yeah. there. And we try and give good content on everything that we do. So there, there's a little life lesson, hopefully, in everything. But we can do a lot more on YouTube. So YouTube goes much more in depth mm. um, to try and change that mindset. And, um, you know, tell youngsters, you know, you, you can be well off. The opportunities are there. And generally, it's just a case of taking that opportunity rather than moaning about the opportunity you aren't getting. You know, it's, get out there and do it. No, I love it, man. Thank God for Curtis, because honestly, <laughs> I do feel like you undersell yourself because when I'm talking to you and you're telling me about, like, you're an entrepreneur, you're a businessman, you're a negotiator, but you also were creative, you know what I mean? And you're a teacher. There's so <laughs> many elements that... No, there's a lot. I'm looking... Because as we're having a conversation, I'm, I'm kind of picking apart more of your experience and seeing, like, the kind of level of, of what mm. you've actually created. No, so... Um, so now that you're on TikTok, you're getting lots of people kind of engaging with you. Did the coaching element start after or before the TikTok? Or was it something you always wanted to do? Um, I would say it's something I've always wanted to do, but I, I, I enjoy it now. Yeah. You know, it's another string to the bow, isn't it, if you yeah. like. Yeah. And um, it's just the feedback that I enjoy. You know, when you get someone telling you you've changed their life and you think, well... You only asked me a couple of questions, but the reality is most people don't need um, to be told what to do. They don't need to be told. They've got a good idea of what, what they want to do and yeah. how they want to do it. And generally, it's just a little gentle nudge in the right direction. And if you help make that nudge, that's the difference you make, isn't it? You yeah. know? And you do make a step difference to their lives. That's like in your own experience. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that you know, my mentor didn't charge me. Yeah. You know, so, you know, why should I, yeah. you know, if I can pass that on and people can learn and develop and improve their, their wealth, you know, or their life, they might want to go into business. They might just want to be a little bit better off by starting a side hustle to create a little bit more income so they can invest. 
you know, that's what it's all about. It's no good moaning and saying, oh, I only get paid enough to live. Yeah, well, you may do, but you have got hours in which you could actually create something else, particularly a passive income, because that's all about time. So if you've got spare time, create something, let that passive income in and invest that. And then you're always going to have some money behind you. Yeah, it's true. I, I love one thing you said about investments when you were talking about when you invest the money, you haven't lost it. You've just put it into another place where you can get the money back later. Exactly. And I, I think of it as spending <laughs> and going down the shop, but you haven't spent it. Yeah. You get the enjoyment of, yep, there we go. I, I, I've spent some money that I've earned. I've earned all this. I've worked really hard. There we are. But you can have it back. It's yeah. like buying a house, isn't it? You know, yeah. you, you may part with the money, but it's still there. Yeah. You know, when you buy some designer clothing, you go, Whoa, don't I look good today? And tomorrow it's like, oh, God, I've dropped half my dinner down here. You know, it's not as good as it was, and yeah. it cost me, you know, best part of £200. <laughs> What's that all about? Yeah. I really don't understand that. So. No, I, 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 I rate it, man. Um, is there any kind of um, other investment tips, just because we have you here and I have to take some coaching advice, is there anything you'd recommend people investing in or any investments outside of your business that you've been making that are kind of highly. Um, kind of highly recommended right now well the, the the best thing first of all is to invest in yourself mm. you know if you don't if you don't invest in yourself then you, you're making a bit of a mistake you mm. need to first of all invest in yourself you know maybe increase your skills you know find something that you're good at and then you can create wealth from that once you've created a bit of wealth and you've put a little bit aside for yourself you know, in an emergency fund, then it doesn't matter. If you want to take a, a, a risk on investing in stocks, you can do that. If you want to do a long-term um, sort of investment with someone like Vanguard, that's fantastic because you can just do a regular amount every What's month. What's Vanguard for people that are uh, listening? Vanguard basically um, do lots of different lifestyle investments that you can do. They've actually just started advertising on British television. Oh, wow. I saw an advert last night for them. Um, I don't get paid it's just someone I use <laughs> yeah. um, and I find them very very easy so you can find um, a, 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 an investment that suits you now for me I like um, index funds because they take lots of companies and then you're, you're a shareholder or a stakeholder in those companies all of them yeah. so if one goes down it doesn't matter you support yeah. if one goes up you're not going to go up quite as quick as that but you know your, your overall investment is going to be relatively safe and although on Vanguard it will say quite a high risk on some of them, like a six. You know, it's not really super high risk. It's not like putting all your money into one company you think is going to go mental and then it flops. That's yeah. high risk. Yeah. You know, this is quite a safe way of saving. And if you do it regularly and consistently, you don't even miss the money. It becomes habit, doesn't it? You know, if you're putting a hundred pound away a month or fifty pound away a month, whatever it happens to be, yeah. you get used to that. And also lifestyle inflation. Just because you're earning more doesn't mean you've got to spend more. Yeah, if you could live easily one, yeah. off £20,000 a year and you're now getting £50,000, well, elevate a little bit if you want. Elevate to 25 is quite a big jump. Yeah. Elevate to 30 that's a massive jump. But you've got twenty grand that could be working for you. And then when it's working for you, that's a passive income. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and it's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. You know, so lifestyle inflation is... Uh, is quite a hard thing to get through to people quite I, I, I totally agree mm. because you kind of you buy it according to how how you're how you're growing you yeah. know and you start to tell yourself you need certain things you know I, I've always had this conversation with my wife because we were living near Marks and Spencer and we started shopping at Marks and Spencer and I was like I've, li I've shopped at Sainsbury's my whole life why do we need to buy it at Marks and Spencer now because exactly. we live near it you know yeah. so I, I definitely think that's important um speaking of family um what is it like working, have, essentially having a family business with your son? I feel like as it's a father. It's fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. You can't beat it. We have some brilliant arguments. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we may develop a podcast as well yeah. before long because we, we have some, some very different views. And I think the arguments that we get into sometimes would be you know, great podcast. Yeah, material. I love it. Generational kind yeah, of exactly. like perspective. You know, like, I know because I've, I've been around. <laughs> I know because I'm the youth. Yeah, you know, so that. there's some really good arguments to, to be had. Kind of like the characters um, on your TikTok in a exactly, way, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's a lot of fun. You know, it's really, really good. And of course, because my son wasn't interested in the RC radio control stuff, I thought, well, I'm not going to be working with my son. I'm not going to pass my business. I'm not going to pass any of that information on. And this is the perfect vehicle for us to share. And yeah. it's, it's proved very, very good. No, I love it, man. Um, Thank you very much, Mark. Before, because it's seven figures, before we end, we have to ask you the seven figure question. Um, how did it feel when you saw your first seven figures? 
Well, I can't actually remember seeing them <laughs> um, because it would have been a, a multitude of investments, house properties, business, estimated worth and so on and so forth. All I can say is once you get to seven figures, you've bought yourself freedom. And once you've got that freedom to do what you want pretty much when you want, then that is a really, really good feeling. You know, you're no longer selling your time five days a week just to recover two days you know for yourself and most people don't even get that now most people are doing six days a week only getting a Sunday for recovery and then having to go back to work yeah, yeah. and I think that freedom and free spirit that's in everyone if you can release that that's the point you know seven figures or maybe less or maybe more yeah. has made it for you <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for your time Mark guys so if anyone wants to find out more information about Mark you can check him out on YouTube and TikTok Mark Tilbury is it TikTok is it Mark Tilbury on just TikTok Mark as Tilbury, well Tilbury yep straight in there I definitely recommend the videos like it caught my attention and there's a lot of value to be gained so don't sleep and check that out if you want to watch more episodes of seven figures check out our YouTube channel seven figures podcast and if you're on the go and you don't have time to sit down and watch it you can also listen to it on Apple Spotify and other streaming networks seven figures business podcast Thank you.